so much for doing this, mate. It's it's a real pleasure to talk to you. Um, mate, how are you? Haven't Not seen or haven't seen from you or heard your voice for a little while. Yeah, well, I'm really good now that uh, you finally made contact with me. I'm thinking, gee, what's it going to take for, uh, for the great Duncan to, to get in touch with me? Yeah, but uh, no, uh, just joking. Um, I'm, I'm okay, yeah. I finished up at Fox Sports at the end of December. And uh, so I've just had a, a couple of months off just uh, looking around. I had a few things lined up uh, overseas, but uh, obviously uh, we can't do that anymore. So I've just been uh, reflecting on what was a, a great stint, a great knock at Fox Sports, trying to help out wherever I can. Uh, if people come to me looking for a little bit of advice or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking to people about all sorts of things. But, uh, yeah, the, the months are flying by and enjoying the, the rugby that's on at the moment. Yeah, it's frustrating not being part of it all, I guess. But uh, you have to just keep remembering that I did have a very good knock. I have no regrets whatsoever. And so... I'm just sort of uh, relying on uh, past deeds, really. Mate, I, I thought when, when I got the opportunity to talk to you, I thought it'd be really interesting to talk about commentary and, and the craft and profession of commentary. And, and, you know, it's not a common job in terms of rugby or league or, or anything like that. How did you get a start into the commentary world? Or how did you get along that path? I, I think you have to have a little bit of commentator in you if, you, if you know what I mean. And by that, I mean, um, you know, when you get an opportunity, you have to be able to, to take it. Um, I went to a, a bush race meeting in Western Queensland uh, when I was 13. And I used to pick up the best bets and, and imitate the race callers of the day, do phantom calls, if you like. And one day at Longreach, the race caller didn't turn up. The word got around, can anyone call the races? And bearing in mind, there were probably five, six, seven, eight horses in each race. And I put my hand up and uh, I dread to think what it sounded like, but um, I became a little bit of a novelty because I'm just sort of using all the sayings that the great race callers of the day had. And I'm talking about Ken Howard in Sydney, Bert Bryant in Melbourne, Vince Curry, Wayne Wilson in, in, in Brisbane. And uh, that led to an ongoing little thing when uh, school holidays would come around, I'd go out to, uh, to the bush and, and call some races. And then the local radio station, 4LG Longreach, took an interest in me. When I finished high school, you could either go with the ABC and probably after about three years, you'd end up with something called a diploma of announcing, as they called it in those days. And if you went with uh, private radio, if you got to Brisbane, if you got to the big smoke, you'd, you'd made it. So I worked at 4VL Longreach, 4VL Charleville, 4LM Mount Isa, 4WK Toowoomba, and then 4KQ in Brisbane. And uh, that's, how, that's how it all started. So I had an opportunity and I took it. A lot of people don't get those opportunities. And, you know, uh, I've what clocked up uh, four decades now broadcasting. But with the radio, were you doing horse racing or were you doing oh. other stuff as well? You do a lot of everything in, in, in the bush. Um, yeah, called some uh, horse racing, called rugby league. Uh, you do a, a shift on uh, the radio station. So you could do the breakfast shift. You write copy. You produce ads. You uh, go and do news stories, you know, the local cattle sales or whatever. Um, call sport on, on, on the weekend and just gain as much experience as you can. Uh, and then eventually you keep moving towards the coast. And if you hit the big time, hit the big smoke, well, you pretty much made it. Yeah. How did you make the jump from, from radio to Fox? Or was there anything in between that? Yeah, I worked at uh, 4KQ in Brisbane initially, and uh, they were doing racing, and they were up against the establishment, 4BC at the time, and Alan Thomas was our main caller, and Alan went on to be, to be one of the great callers in Queensland. He had a, a really long career. Um, but then the radio station was sold and they dropped sport. And so I went back to announcing, didn't really enjoy it. My mates were going overseas. So I went overseas for a month, ended up staying two years, came back to Brisbane, back to 4KQ, did some weekend sport, nothing permanent was happening. Um, and uh, my wife, uh, well, eventually she became my wife. Uh, she, she was from Auckland, New Zealand. So we went across to, to Auckland for a we thought maybe you know a few months see what to see what happens and um, I stayed a decade over there so it was like a working holiday in New Zealand started in radio uh, and then got an opportunity to move into uh, TV thanks to rugby league mainly because they didn't really have an established rugby league caller over there at the time because everyone was calling rugby union 
Um, and the longer I stayed in New Zealand, the more successful I was. And then when Super League and Super Rugby started, Fox Sports hired me and I had almost 25 years at Fox Sports. So did you do any league for Fox or was it just... Yeah, just yeah. I, I call the one and only Super League Grand Final. So in the early days of Super Rugby in Australia, uh, Channel 7 did the, the commentary, Gordon Bray and Poido and Buddha. And it went on Fox, but um, and then, of course, we showed all the South African games and all the, the uh, New Zealand games. So whatever rugby we did in those early years uh, that I was at Fox, I did that, you know, shows. Uh, I think we did the World Under-21 Championships and so on. Did the 99 World Cup. But at the same time, I was doing rugby league and I was at the time... Uh, they used to uh, call me the, the number one league caller at uh, the senior league caller at, at Fox, if you like. Uh, but I had to make a decision. And then around about 2001, uh, we took over the commentary of Super Rugby in Australia from Channel 7. And that's when I went down the rugby path and okay. didn't really look back. It was, so it was uh, an opportunity I, I could have stuck with league. But in the end, I went with rugby and the rest is history, pretty much. 213 test matches, 20 years of uh, super rugby. So, yeah, as I said earlier on, I can't complain. It was a great knock. Um, do you have a background in rugby or is your background more in league? I played rugby at school in Queensland. At the time, everyone played uh, played league, but um, occasionally there were there were some uh, small rugby comps, sort of like knockout comps, and uh, I played rugby. When I went to uh, to Brisbane before KQ, I I, uh, I played some rugby. When I went overseas to England for two years, I played some social rugby. London Irish used to have a team. We weren't allowed to kick the ball, so it was you know go out and throw the ball around, have a have a bit of fun, and uh, we played in various tens tournaments around the the UK socially, mind you. And uh, and I I came back to to Brisbane, and a mate was playing for one of the the sub districts teams, and I played uh, centre. Uh, made the Queensland sub districts team. So whenever I do any uh, after dinner speaking, or if I was ever on stage with the great George Gregan or Phil Kearns or Tim Horan, uh, I'd always put our caps together. There were always so many test caps, there were always, always so many super rugby caps, and there were two caps for Queensland sub districts. And it always got a bit of a laugh because people knew who it was. But uh, um, people said to me, I could have been anything, but uh, I was born a broadcaster, and that's the, that's, that's the, uh, the career I chose ahead of rugby. And, and to be honest, probably a better career at the moment. How, what's the week like for you guys? Did, did you, at the start, were you going to games or do they have it in Sydney and you're just in a studio? How, how does it all work? Well, uh, in, in uh, normal times. So out, out in, of, in, out, pre-COVID, yeah, pre-COVID. Yeah, pre, Pre-COVID, yeah, at, at the ground all, all the time. Monday would be a, a review. We'd all get together and re- review the, the weekend, bearing in mind there was probably a midweek show as well that we had to uh, prepare for. Um, and it's, it's not 12, 8, 10 hours a day. It's basically um, keeping an eye on, on, on everything. You have to be aware of what, what's going on. Personally, uh, I can't wait for the teams to be announced. You know, I really don't settle into to my week until I've actually written the names down. And, and I'm a little old school because uh, I, I use a manila folder, a print broker made of mine, do it up one to 23. And uh, I just can't wait to get those names down. And then after that, you start filling it in. Notes about the player. Um, Fox Sports now have a very good stats department. Uh, back in the early days, you'd keep all the stats yourself, but now it's all computerized and someone is supplying you with a match pack. Um, but you just sort of go along to training, just uh, be aware of uh, picking up little snippets that, that viewers might might want. Uh, and, and I'm very big on preparation and my advice to young guys wanting to get into uh, broadcasting, sports broadcasting is, you know, preparation is the key. You know, uh, I, I would just roll up to a game knowing that I, I, I've done my prep and uh, and I'm, I'm ready to go. So nothing can phase you uh, after that. So bearing in mind, I was working full time. Some people like uh, the, the expert comments, uh, people that you, you you hear nowadays, you know, the Horans and Kearns and uh, Kafer, et cetera, uh, they have day jobs as well. So it's, it's harder for them. But for me, I was paid to be you know a broadcaster and, and, and uh, I had had the hours in the week to do the preparation. So, so Monday would be like a review meeting. When, when would you actually go to whatever city 
Did was it only Australia, or did you get to go overseas as well? Uh, d- during the playoffs, we we would go to New Zealand or, or South Africa. But during the season, we would take their commentary and they'd take our commentary. Um, if we're a, a, a typical weekend from a broadcast point of view, is I normally did two games a weekend: Friday and Saturday night. So Friday morning, we would uh, jump on a plane and head to Melbourne to do the Rebels versus whoever. Stay overnight in Melbourne, catch the plane the next morning back to Sydney, to Perth, to Brisbane, to Canberra or whatever. And you'd stay overnight after the game and, and head home on, on, on a Sunday. So uh, it was all sort of down pat uh, after a while. Uh, overseas trips, obviously, you, you need to get there um, a, a day or two earlier. I mean, and the key was always whether, whether it was a, a playoff in Super Rugby or a test uh, match, you try and get to the captain's runs. For the main training on Thursday, if you couldn't get to that, at least get to the captain's runs on the, on the day before. Get a feel for the stadium and, uh, you know, you can pick up a bit of information there at the final press conference as well. So in terms of actually game day commentary, cor- correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you are the play-by-play caller? And then you have a couple of the expert players who are the colour commentators. Is, is that how it works? Yeah, yeah. And I, I had a, a sort of a, a standard deal with my expert commentators. So I'm play by play. And as soon as the play breaks down, you should shut up and, and get out of there and, and let the, the experts come in. If it's a try, for example, if it, if it was a, a Vax try, it would be, say, Rod Kafer or Greg Martin with the first replay followed by Kernsey. If it was a forwards try to be Kernsey having first crack at that, and then, then the, the back expert would, would come in and do the, do the sec, second replay. But yeah, it's sort of like conducting an, an, an orchestra. It's, it's, it's um, you know, experience. Helps, you so know. You're, guiding, you're guiding them in the areas that you want yeah. them to go, basically? Pretty much. The, the play-by-play caller is pretty much conducting the band, the orchestra. Uh, and what about producers? Do you have people in your ears saying, hey, Clarky, look at this and yeah. you know, let's replay this and that yeah, sort of thing? There's always a producer on, on, on hand keeping an, eye, keeping an eye on things and, and the producers uh, know their stuff as well. And they're sitting back like, like you guys, like everyone watching, uh, whether it be in the, it's in the pub or in the lounge room, and um, they, 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 they're sending out messages, you know, the game might be a bit stop start, so you'll get a little message in your ear saying, oh, "I think we'd better pump it up a little bit, keep the energy levels up, all that sort of stuff." So it's 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 very much a, a team effort, and uh, the director has a big role to play as well because I have what you call open talkback. I've always worked with that. Some commentators don't; they think it's a uh, a distraction. But I like to have what you call open talkback, so I can hear the director talking to the cameraman, talking to the people doing the replays talking to the producer um, so uh, he doesn't have to concentrate on directly talking to me and, and I can I know if there's an issue somewhere I, I know it because I'm hearing it um, but the, the director also has a has a big part to play on where the commentary where the coverage goes as well okay that's interesting so in in terms of a game day broadcast total people on you know video you know production, uh, the commentary, roughly how many people go into broadcasting a game on a weekend? Okay, well, you'd have uh, a normal super rugby spec would be eight or nine cameras. Yeah. Um, uh, eight of those would be man. You might have one or two cameras that aren't man, like dressing room cameras or corner posts or something like that. But say about eight cameramen, uh, people doing the replays, you'd have three to four uh, you'll have a producer, you'll have a director, you'll have a director's assistant, you'll have a, normally a vision switcher. So when the director's saying, take camera four, take camera two, go to one, go to three, someone's actually switching those sitting beside the, the director. Uh, a floor manager who's controlling things on the sideline, telling uh, teams when they can come out, uh, grabbing people for interviews at halftime or, or, or at full time. And then you've got the uh, a sound man in the booth in the OB truck. Uh, you've also got sound assistance on the sideline because we've got people on the sideline doing interviews and uh, you'll have some sound assistance upstairs in the commentary box. You'll have uh, technicians controlling things, making sure the picture looks good in the truck and then other technicians floating around in case a, you know, a camera breaks down or a video uh, machine breaks down or whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a cast of thousands. It's a big production and that's just... Uh, 
how, how it is. Day and, in, day out. Pro- probably a bit nerdy question, but I'm, I'm interested by this stuff, so so bear with me. But would they fly guys, uh, say you would go two games, would the, would the whole crew go with you as well or was there, there crews in the town that you were at? No, there's, there's, a, there's a core crew. Uh, if I went to Melbourne, for example, in the early days in particular when the Melbourne Rebels came around, uh, some, quite a few of the guys were doing league, but uh, a lot of them obviously were doing AFL, maybe football as well. So, so we'd bring... Um, two or three core uh, camera people uh, in and over the years they were able to more or less mentor the other cameras, uh, cameramen and bring them up to, to speed but I'd normally travel with a, a director, a producer, uh, maybe a senior uh, replay uh, person and uh, maybe a floor manager as well so try and use as many local people as possible because we're all trying to save money by not having yeah. people in hotels and in rental cars. Travel costs. And flying around, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. Um, what about in terms of mentors? Did you have anyone that you would go to for feedback or someone that you looked up to in broadcasting? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm pretty much my most harshest critic. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd watch, watch the replay and... and uh, either give myself a tick or you know sometimes a little bad habits creep in not majors but um just little things so such as such as oh you might say the same thing you know too too often you know you, you, you try and mix things up a, a little bit or if, if uh, you might get a try in the first minute and a try in the 78th minute and and if you sort of call it in a similar fashion you know um i'd, I'd sort of give myself a little a reminder to, to to mix it up a bit um uh, mentors back back in the early days when I wanted to be a horse race caller, um, I remember writing to the great Ray Warren, uh, and um, he gave me some some tips, and I reminded him, uh, you know, twenty or thirty years later, and uh, he got a bit of a chuckle out of that. I had a lot to do with Graham Hughes in the early days. If you remember Graham Hughes, when I was calling rugby league, um, Hughes he was uh, a guy that um, I, you know I spent a lot of time with, and used to. Um, pick up some tips from him uh, from a rugby point of view. I've just worked on tours and got to know some great rugby callers uh, around the world. And, you know, we'd all get together. It's a bit of a social club really and exchange ideas and, th- and things like that. But I relied uh, a heck of a lot on the head of sport or, or a, uh, you know, a senior producer uh, because sometimes again, you can also develop little uh, little bad habits uh, that you don't pick up on because they just sound natural to you. But um, I remember one someone saying to me, Sonny Bill, uh, he's got a surname when he started playing playing rugby uh, and everyone called him Sonny Bill. But, you know, someone just picked up saying, you know, it might be nice to throw his, his surname in occasionally. Williams. Um, Richie was Richie. Everyone knew Richie, but he also had a surname. So why... Yeah, call someone else by his surname and, 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 and not Richie or Dan Carter uh, or whoever it might, might be. Um, nicknames work sometimes. Um, you know, sometimes maybe uh, you, can, you can overdo nicknames, you know. It's Michael Cooper rather than Hoops or it's Adam Ashley Cooper rather than Coops and, and so it goes on. So, yeah, I've been lucky uh, throughout my career. I've never really had a major faux pas um, on, on air, but there are little things that you know. Sometimes you have to, um, uh, you know, go back and and look at the look at the the replay and and um, make sure you don't sort of or you mix things up a little bit as I was talking about before. Mate, what's the hardest name you've ever had to pronounce? Um, yeah, Heron Ordeke, Heron Ordeke, um the, the great back row for France. He was. You know, he came along, and we're thinking, "My goodness, you know, is it French? What is it?" And um, so, so it took a took a while to get my my uh, tongue around that one. Currently, no one need a wasi. People struggle with that, but it's one of the easiest names. And I found once you once you master the Fijian names and break, break them down phonetically, Tangi Thakambao, you know, Valdan and uh, they, they they all run smoothly smoothly off your tongue. Um, so, uh, you know, we've had. Um, uh, you know, when, when Georgia plays at a World Cup or something, they, or Russia, yeah. <laughs> no, you, would you actually practice it? Would you actually practice it? Oh, so yeah, write it, yeah, yeah. And, and I write, would, write it down, write it down phonetically. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, would you ever go to to like 
the Russian manager or someone and go, hey, oh, yeah, you, yeah, you would yeah. do that, yeah, and that's that's part of your prep preparation. Um, yeah, the, the, the big thing back, back in the early days when when even a, a, a media manager would travel with a with a foreign team and didn't have a great command of the um English language, they've, they've all got a either a high commission or a um uh, a consulate um in in Australia, um, and so um you know, or an embassy. So, so you, you could put a phone call through there and you'd always get someone that could, um, could help you out. Uh, but now most of the media managers and, and most of the teams travel with, um, you know, an English pronunciation guide. So yeah, uh, it's all about, all about preparation. And, and it just, just, uh, makes for a, for a, uh, you know, it's fun when, when you, when you see these long names and, and you nail them. Uh, and, and you know some of some of my uh, colleagues have uh, had some major clangers over, over the years. I can't really remember anything, but you can imagine Kernsey not quite getting his name around with Fijian names, some of names. So uh, Japanese also uh, is, is very easy, but people get freaked out by their Japanese uh, names. But you know Takakawa is Takakawa. It's uh, you know break it up phonetically, and uh, and and it's it's very easy. I guess that's the great thing about rugby is that you've, you know, in any game, you can have Georgians, Russians, French, you know, and, and you don't really get that in too many other games. So it just adds a little bit of colour to rugby, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a world game, uh, let, let's face it, and, uh, and, and it makes it a lot of fun. You know, when, uh, for example, when Georgia plays uh, the Wallabies at, at, a, at a Rugby World Cup, the Wallabies are expected to win, but, you know, I put – so much effort into the to the Georgian team, making sure that I've got uh, you know the names sussed and, um, and 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 I know a lot about the, these players. So you spend a lot of time on the opposition more so than on on the Wallabies because we get to know the Wallabies and people at home pretty much know them as well. So um, that's always a, a lot of fun to put the preparation in and and get through the job. And someone once told me that you know if someone's got a surname, make an effort. You know, uh, I think um, in, in rugby league, there was a lot of flack in recent years uh, where, you know, the commentators were not really trying with the, with the Polynesian names, for, for example. So, um, but that, that's, that's uh, improved now. And uh, yeah, if someone's got a surname, at least, at least make an effort. And there's another thing, a little tip in, in broadcasting, say it with conviction, because if you make it sound right, you know, most people wouldn't know the difference apart from the player's mother or father or family or friends. So, uh, yeah, whenever in doubt, say it with conviction. I think you could use that in every aspect of life, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> Mate, I won't keep you too much longer. I'm really grateful for your time. Just a couple of random questions for you. Favourite touring location? Have you got anywhere that you really, really enjoyed going? Oh yeah, the UK is special, and and I, we had a wonderful seven weeks during the 2015 Rugby World Cup, and you know Ireland's a great destination. I I love, I love France. Um, well, I should start by saying that, that I've really had no bad times around <laughs> the rugby world. South Africa is wonderful. Uh, they're so much like us, but you've got the animals, you've got the uh, the golf courses, you know, you've got you've got the coast. And uh, you've got rugby, and you've got people who really appreciate the, appreciate the game, and, and and socially, they're very good as well. Uh, you're always invited to a braai, a barbecue, um, in wonderful times in uh, places like um, Argentina. Uh, I've been to Punta del Este in Uruguay for for sevens. That that that, that was amazing. Mar del Plata in Argentina, Mendoza, Buenos Aires. Uh, yeah, it's it's. One of the, you know, you've just got to be grateful that, that, that it's, it's a world game. And if you had a job like mine, it was just amazing to, to travel around. And during the uh, COVID lockdown, I was asked by Fox to uh, put out a photo every day if I could. And, um, and just to you know, keep, keep a bit of social media thing going. And, and I look back on my photos and I just, um, you know, uh, uh, was amazed from 2006 when we started doing test match calls. Some some of the photos, some of the countries, some of the people I met were amazing. This Nelson Mandela, for example, you know, uh, Jonah Lomo just spent some time with Jonah on the speaking circuit, and so it goes on with some 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 wonderful people and some wonderful memories. So I'll say it again: no regrets whatsoever. Am I finished? No, I'd like to keep going because I know I can contribute a little bit more. But you know, there's probably one. 
one job in uh, in Australia, and at the moment uh, I don't have it. So we'll just see what the, what the future holds. Mate, uh, in terms of players, who's the best player you think you've ever seen? Is there anyone that stands out? Uh, I've been asked this quite a bit, you know, because I've had a few milestones, 150 test matches, 200 tests and 20 years of calling Super Rugby. And the guy I, I always come back to is, is George Smith. You know, started, I thought you'd say that. Yeah, you know, he just started out as a sort of 19, 18, 19-year-old and, and you knew straight away that this guy had, had something special. But for a back rower... He could kick, he could chase, um, you know, he was so good over the ball, obviously, as a, as a fetcher. Um, but we saw him do some some amazing things. And and, and I, I guess I lean towards him because of longevity. He was around for, for such a long time. He's such a humble human being as well. So um, I, I, I just really enjoyed um, calling George over all, all those years. And just I was in awe of some of the skills he, he displayed as a back rower. Um, you know, you go back to the early days and, and a guy that should have played more test matches was, was Andrew Walker. He was unbelievable. And that combination uh, that they had, Andrew Walker at the back and, and Joe Roth on, on the wing for, for the Brumbies in the Halcyon days, you know, that 20, 2004 Super Rugby final was absolutely amazing. Um, but, but um, you know, to call, Andrew Walker was amazing. So was, so was Joe Roth. Um, Overseas players, you know, Johnny was always great to call because Johnny Wilkinson, because he was um, so so dominant in that in that England team at, at the time, and we all know that he pulled off a few uh, match winning feats a, a, as well. Um, Brian O'Driscoll was always great great to call. Um, yeah, the the list goes on really. But if I had to settle on someone, it was it was George. I put him. I put him ahead of uh, Richie McCaw because he definitely had more skills than than, than Richie McCaw, and um, yeah, he's my man. Mate, um, I thought you were going to say that, so that's probably my call too. Who, when you look back over your career, is there any particular moments that stand out for you in terms of games or memories or anything, whatever comes to mind? I, I don't have one one highlight. I have quite a few highlights, and um, I always loved the Wallabies beating the All Blacks. Unfortunately, uh, <laughs> over those years calling Test matches, I never called one Bledisloe Cup winning series for the Wallabies. I never called the Wallabies beating the All Blacks on New Zealand soil. And remember, I was calling from 2006 through to 2020. So it just goes to show how dominant the All Blacks have been over that what, 16 years or 14 years or whatever it is. Um, and um, I never called a winning Australian team Super Rugby playoff, whether it be a quarter final or a semi final or a final on New Zealand's soil. So I, they're the disappointments, but the, the highlights. 2001, we finally had an Australian team win Super Rugby. Um, and, and that was the the, uh, the Brumbies over the Sharks. Wasn't a classic match, but job done. Finally, an Australian team were uh, crowned Super Rugby champions. And then 2004, that match I spoke about earlier on, the, the, the Tri-Fest, two teams just throwing the ball around and, and going hell for leather and the, the Brumbies triumphant over the, over the Crusaders. 2011 was a very special year and the win by the, by the uh, Reds over the Crusaders just kept what was an amazing ride and pretty much, you know, people loved their, their own teams, but that year people got on board with the Reds because they were just playing a wonderful brand of rugby entertainment. Um, I still think it's uh, right up there with some of the highest ratings that the, uh, that Fox sports have had over the years, that 2011 uh, final and uh, 2015 at long last, the, the, the Waratahs and, and Bernard Foley, the Iceman, had to kick the penalty at the end to, to do it. But it wasn't just the final. That just capped off an amazing run under Michael Checker's coaching that, that year. Uh, and, and they got through. So I, I remember the, uh, the great Wallaby wins, you know, and there have been plenty over the, over the All Blacks. I remember Radiki Samo running away and scoring that try at, um, at, at uh, Suncorp Stadium. Uh, that was a great win over the over the uh, All Blacks. We beat them in in Melbourne back in around about 2007, I think it was. It was a wonderful occasion, and so it goes on. Uh, I've worked at every Rugby World Cup, so that you know, that great memories there. And not I haven't called it all of them, but I've had a position at uh, every Rugby World Cup, so I'm very proud and privileged to to uh, to say that. 
and also um, that 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 run of uh, the Wallabies in 2015. I was at Twickenham in front of 80,000. I thought I was playing. I was part of 80,000, I should say. Uh, and that was our home ground. Home ground. We had five Saturdays in a row leading up to the final. We had the narrow escape against uh, Scotland. Uh, in the quarter final and beat Argentina in the semi final, and you know we we're in the final for a long time with the the, the All Blacks, but just couldn't go the the, the distance. But uh, I'll always re remember that, and um, you know I've called three World Cup finals now. Special moments, amazing. Yeah, Australia only in one of them, but it uh, it was a special uh, special treat to not only be at the World Cup working, but to actually call finals as well. I've got two more. Have you got time for two more questions? And yeah. Hopefully, hopefully oh, well, sure. I just don't want to bore you and the ball. Mate, mate, I'm, <laughs> mate, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm, I'm loving it. Who, how do you view Australian rugby at the moment? And that's possibly a very long winded question, but what are your thoughts? Well, no, I'm not. I'm not happy with it. You know, you, we saw last year uh, when we had the Tri Nations after South African pulled out. It wasn't the the rugby championship, so we had the opportunities to to win games there and ended up with uh, with you know drawing um, three three games, one against New Zealand and two against uh, uh, Argentina. And um, you know, we had we had this this thing where we're throwing these young guys in, and, and yes. They are they are the future, but you know we we we've we've thrown too many of them into the deep end. I I believe, and and subsequently we're not getting the, we're not getting the results. Um, you talk to anyone, even uh, Dave Rennie, uh, publicly, you probably won't say it like this, but privately, I, I do know that uh, he was disappointed in the skill level at some of the players when they got into uh, into a, a Wallaby camp, um, where you know New Zealand, I think New Zealand and South Africa. Um, develop their skills a, a lot a lot earlier than than us, and you just have to compare New Zealand rugby at the moment. What we're seeing on Friday and Saturday night, the five o'clock game out of New out of New Zealand, the skill level there is is, is higher than what we're seeing out of the the Australian teams. Um, and, and we've put so much faith in the uh, the young guys, the Waratahs at the moment. It's not paying off for them. I think the other teams have been a bit more careful and they haven't sort of flooded their team with all the 20 year olds 21 year olds but Australian rugby at the moment on the field uh, the results are not great and, and in, in Australia rugby is results driven as I said before over over that period when I was calling test test matches and, and super rugby we, we won four super rugby titles out of something like 25 years you know it's not great for a, for a nation like Australia and we haven't held the Bledisloe since 2000 and what was it, 2003, we lost it to, to the All Blacks. So, so it's been a, a lean period. And for the game to get back to uh, being, you know, a really dominant code in Australia, uh, it's going to take more consistency. We have to win a, a lot more games at, at all levels. Uh, there's a good base at, at club land at the moment. There's a good following, I believe for uh, the Shoot Shield and the Hospital Cup in, in Brisbane, for example. Um, we have to somehow try and, you know, get that out on, on television more than what we have been doing. But um, overall, uh, there's, a, there's a long way to go. And from an administrator's point of view, well, obviously, uh, COVID didn't help either, but already prior to that, uh, you know, the code was almost broke. So people like Rob Clark and Hamish McLennan have done a good job to borrow some money from World Rugby to keep it afloat to get those test matches uh, uh, completed last year. I know they're hanging out for the French tour this year. Uh, hopefully COVID won't restrict that and the French will be able to come down and we'll get three uh, test matches in, in July against France. Bloody good team at the moment, by the way. It'll be a great series. Um, Absolutely. But, but we need, we need you know, 100% crowds by, by then and hopefully we're heading in that direction. Um, but and that but that'll that'll sort of fill the coffers a little bit, and then we can go into uh, a Bledisloe Cup and and the Rugby Championship again, and and hopefully by the by the end of the year, you know the game will be in uh, a better state financially. But yeah, pro problems ahead, and if we can just keep keep winning or you know be be more consistent with our performances, uh, that's going to help in the long run or the short term. I totally agree. I, I was speaking to Jake Gordon yesterday, and he said to me, "Think of this: in Sydney, you've got." 10 league teams, two AFL teams, number of cricket teams, soccer teams, and the sevens team. So if, if you're losing, there's plenty of other teams that they can support. And if you think about any other sporting market in the world, apart from maybe Melbourne, they don't really have that. 
Yeah. So that's a bit of, bit of a unique challenge in a way as well. You can't have um, a team like the Waratahs uh, losing losing three in, three in a row. Uh, and, yes, we know it's a young team, but, you know, this it was a young team last year and probably the year before that as well. So you, you can't just keep coming up with, the, with excuses like that. Uh, last year was also a different year because of COVID, but in 2018, 2019, 55% of the rugby audience on Fox Sports came from New South Wales. 35% came from Queensland. So there's 90% from the two big states. If those two teams aren't performing, you know, uh, the game's in, in, in trouble. Only 10% were pretty much following the, the, the Brumbies and, and, and the Rebels. Now, I'm not too sure what, what the numbers are like uh, this year, but I wouldn't imagine they would have changed a great deal. So you need either the Waratahs or the Reds to be strong for Australian rugby to have a, a strong, um, not, not so much a supporter base, but a strong viewership anyway on TV. Preferably both of them, and that's got nothing against uh, the Brumbies or, or, or the Rebels, but the, and now the Force are coming into it, of course, so they're back again. But, um, yeah, Jake's right. You know, when, when the Waratahs aren't, aren't winning, people can jump on to their league team. Everyone's pretty much got a league team. There's AFL to support if, if you want to. And there's club rugby as well. You know, you can go back. As well, yeah, as well. I didn't even think of that, yeah. Yeah. Um, last question, mate. I'm really grateful for your time. I've been asking everyone this. What advice would you give 18-year-old Greg Clark looking back? Uh, well, um, first thing first thing is take opportunities. Be prepared for when that opportunity comes along. So I go back to that word again, preparation is the key. Uh, don't burn any bridges because um, while I've had a, a great stint at, at Fox Sports, I know colleagues uh, that I work with in New Zealand and some colleagues at, at Fox Sports who, who burn a few bridges and, uh, and, and paid the price for it. So you don't have to be a yes man, but, but you have to be a team man. You have to be a team player. You know, you, you can't trample on people going up um, because they're going to be trampling on you as, as you're going down. So uh, be, be a team player. I know, I know it, it, it's all cliches, but, but basically, um, you know, you, you've got to do preparation. You, you've got to, um, uh, to have pride in, in, in your work and pride in how you go about your work, pride in how you go about being a team man and uh, you know, look, look after one another as well. So they're, they're, the, they're the sort of things that I've tried to, you know, stick to throughout my career and uh, I managed to get quite a long way with it. So um, hopefully there won't be too many people saying too many bad things uh, about me because I've tried to be a, a good bloke uh, all, all the way through and um, I've supported my colleagues wherever possible. So, yeah, just be a good bloke and, uh, you know, do the hard yards. I love it. That's a great way to end, mate. Thank you so much for this. This is awesome. Thanks very much for your time. appreciate it. Mate, um, good to hear your voice and best of luck with whatever happens next. Yeah, we'll see what happens. You might, I might pop up here and there, somewhere along the line. So uh, I've got something to contribute. Contribute. So I'll, I'll keep, uh, I'll keep working at it. Absolutely, mate. Thanks, Clarky. Appreciate it, mate. Enjoy your avo. Cheers. Cheers, mate. See ya.